my, uh, uh, I once earned a scholarship and I had to attend a dinner and it was a wild and terrible weather at the, ni at the din night of the dinner and the uh, man who was in charge of the scholarship said you're all disqualified by the stupidity of coming out <laughs> in such bad weather. <laughs> but anyway, anyway. Um, to open my talk on Kashan, I offer you a family photo. The little boy in the center is uh, the five-year-old Kashani, a uh, five-year-old Kashani, pictured in a photograph taken in 1906. He is my father, who was born in 1901. He was invaded by eight Kashani elders to join him in this photograph. I haven't the faintest idea who the other people are. <laughs> I don't know. They look, they look dangerous, anyway. <laughs> um, he, he was in, uh, uh, the photo, uh, clearly post-medieval Kashan, is shown here merely to explain my deep interest in that city. No city history of Kashan survives from the Middle Ages, and it is possible that no such history was ever written. Kashan was rarely a seat of government, and most dynastic hi uh, histories have only passing references to Kashan. Uh, while it is important to write the histories of large cities, such as Cairo and Baghdad, and I have actually written a history of something on the history of Cairo. It is equally important uh, and somewhat more difficult to write the history of smaller cities like Kashan, for which the textual evidence survives in many scattered sources. Given its importance as an artisanal center, the material evidence for the history of Kashan is considerable, but my interpretation of it here is somewhat limited. Why is Kashan where it is? Uh, this is an aerial photograph, obviously, and it shows uh, uh, the mountains uh, near Kashan. Uh, you can see it says Kashan in the center. And at the far end of Kashan, this is the desert up to the right, and that is north. Uh, the, the water flows off these mountains through Kashan as far as the town of Bidgol on the edge of the uh, edge of that uh, desert called Dasht e Kavir, a very ferocious desert in central Iran. Uh, as a result of its <coughs> its location, uh, Kashan has a seasonal River, the Shahab, which upstream is called Kohrud. An elaborate system of underground uh, water channels called the Persian, singular Persian Qanat or Qariz, um, distributes water from the spring at Baghifin. Uh, one of my father's first memories was Baghifin, one of the uh, springs that uh, come from the mountain, and uh, streams down the foothills of the Karkas Mountains to uh, farms and towns on this alluvial plain. More broadly viewed, this system of water channels, although primarily consisting of underground channels, includes surface channels, often the extension of these underground channels as they reach settlements. The canots are built in the same direction as the groundwater flows and have air holes at intervals in order to facilitate the flow of the water. The underground channels minimize loss to evaporation. Of course, it is possible that upstream uh, irrigation through canots lowers the amount of water available uh, downstream. The history of nearby Qom, written in 378 of the Hijra, shows the elaborate attempts to calculate the fraction of, waters, of water as it passes by various l landlords who uh, wish to, um, of course, siphon off the water to their property. These agreements between landlords 
as well as the extensive social cooperation needed to construct and maintain these channels, indicate the cooperation needed to ir irrigate this large and arid land where an alluvial plain comes directly up to the desert. Again, this brown corner in the upper right uh, is of the desert. Uh, why did Kashan emerge as a city? Even early geographers such as Ya'akubi and Ibn Rosta fail to mention Kashan. Uh, one of the earliest references to Kashan is in the geography of Ibn Khuradazba, or Khuradadbe in Persian, who was a postmaster for much of Western Iran, so knew the area intimately. Ibn Khuradazba, writing in the late third or ninth century of the Common Era, refers to two adjacent areas without referring to Kashan as a city. He calls one of them Rostok, that's sub-province, Rostoghi, uh, Rostok, I'm sorry, it's in Arabic, Sard Kashan, it's Sard, Persian Sard, but pronounced here with a Sad, uh, and Rostok Jarm Kashan, which is the Arabization of uh, Garm Kashan, warm Kashan. However, he does not mention Kashan as a city. A small town called Kashan, or in earlier spell spellings, Qasan and various other variants may well have existed near the site of Kashan. But a fundamental factor in its development into a city in the Islamic period was the flight of proto Shiite Arabs from anti Shiite governors of Iraq to central Iran, especially to the developing towns of Qom and Kashan. Qom was older and bigger. Um, Twelver Shiism was not fully formed until at least the fifth, or I would say 11th century of the Common Era. Tabari, the great historian, in his history mentions that anti-Omayyad leader from Iraq, Mutrif ibn al-Mughira, came into opposi open opposition with al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf, the ferocious governor of Iraq, in the year 77 of the Hijra. Motrif was killed, but according to Tabari, his followers fled to Qom and Kashan. If Tabari is not adding Kashan because at a later period it is customary to mention Qom after Kashan, this mention may be the earliest genuine reference to the developing town. A geographer writing in Persian the unknown author of Hudud al-Alam, wonderful book, uh, uh, begun in 372 of the Hijra or 982-3 of the Common Era, says that Kashan, quote, is a city of excellences uh, in which there are numerous Arabs. It has produced many scribes, Dabiron, and uh, and literati, adibam. Uh, this important passage anticipates the role that sophistication in Arabic and scribal talents will play in Kashani history, as I hope the rest of this talk uh, testifies. Arabs were proto -shi these Arabs were proto shis largely of the Ash'ari tribe, as were the Arabs of Qom. The graduate growing importance of Shi orientation. Gradually, from the ninth, uh, during the 9th and 10th century of the Common Era, many proto-Shiites became Twelver Shiites. It's not clear that they all started out as Twelver Shiites, which remained the dominant form of religion in Kashan, as many of the geographers testify. However, some towns in the Kashan district continued to be Sunni right up until the Safavid period, around 1500. Kashan, like several uh, central Iranian cities, changed hands a few times until in the uh, early uh, fourth or 10th century, it, became, it came under Buyid control. The Buyids showed favor to Qom, as the Qom nome, uh, as the uh, uh, history of Qom shows, uh, and 
presumably did so to nearby Kashan until the conquest of central Iran by Mahmud of Ghazna in the 5th or 11th century. It was no secret that Shiites favored Sayyids, uh, and so many descendants of Ali migrated to Shiite cities such as Kashan. Saljuk period. The subsequent contest of Kashan by the Saljuks in 443 or 1051 of the uh, Common Era ushered in a long period of prosperity for the people of Kashan. During the Saljuk period, Kashan became increasingly known for its 12er Shiite uh, adherents. Yaqut al Hamawi, the famous geographer and bi biographer who died in uh, 1227, 1229 of the Common Era, and therefore lived near the end of the Saljuk period, writes in his great compendium on geography, quote, its people are all imami Shi'is, <laughs> end quote. The city flourished in part for economic and in part for political reasons. One of the political reasons is the success of people from Kashan uh, and its surrounding district in acquiring positions in the Saljuk bureaucracy. Um, a Kashani clerk, uh, uh, Ravandi, the author of Rahat Sudur, a wonderful chronicle on the history of the Saljuks, uh, 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 Ravandi uh, uh, says uh, in his Rahat Sudur, quote, holders of senior positions such as Vazir, uh, and uh, chief treasurer, and the majority of clerks in the, Gulf, uh, in the government of the Sultan, that means the great Saljuks, <laughs> uh, are Kashani. Now, this is an obvious exaggeration, but anyway, a lot of them were. Administrators, in large part, co co come, came to uh, these positions because of their excellent education which included calligraphy. Scholarly excellence is always a useful defense against charges of heresy, which, of course, Imami Shi'is encountered continually in the pre-Safavid period. The Saljuk period was the golden age for the founding of madrasas, or seminars, seminaries, throughout Iran. And in Kashan, several such schools were founded. Um, I think I will skip some of this material. Um, okay. Um, uh, another madrasa of the Saljuk era was the Azizia, founded in the second half of the 6th or 12th century by yet another vizier to the great Saljuks, Azizadin ibn Radiyadin al Kashani. Uh, who died in 588 or 1192. Uh, he was a vizier to Sultan Tohrul ibn Arslan. The Nasa'im ul Ashar says of uh, Aziz ad Din, this is the Shiite Kashani vizier to the very Sunni uh, Saljuk uh, uh, rulers, he was one of the heads of department who were extremely skilled and one of the masters among the scribes of financial administration for the two Iraqs. That means Western Iran and Iraq." End quote. Not surprisingly, the curriculum was uh, at this madrasa was said to include deep study of varieties of accounting, istifa, you know, all this Mostofis, <laughs> istifa as well as, quote, multiplication, division, algebra, and other forms, ashkal, uh, ashkal, Persian, I don't know, to be understood through mathematics. I'm not exactly what, sure what those other forms are, but anyway. Nizam al-Mulk, the great vizier of the Saljuk period, was fully aware that these well-educated Shi'i clerks from Kashan, with their excellent handwriting, were penetrating the Saljuk bureaucracy. He writes, in the days of Mahmud, Mas'ud, Tohrul, and Alp Arslan. That uh, list is long, interesting, because the Saljuks obviously want to put, put Mahmud of Ghazna 
<laughs> back of their own line. In the days of these uh, people, may God have mercy on them, no Zoroastrian or Jew or Rafidi, that means Shiite, would have the audacity to appear in a public place or to present himself before a great man. Those who administered the affairs of the Turk, Turks were all professional civil servants and secretaries from Khorasan. Of course, Nizam al Mulk was from Khorasan. <laughs> from Khorasan, who be belonged to the Orthodox um, Hanafi and Shafi'i sects. The heretics of Iraq, which here he means Western Iran, were never admitted as secretaries and tax collectors. In fact, the Turks, and he very clearly identifies the regime as Turks, the Turks never used to employ them at all. They said, these men are of the same religion as the Daylamis, that's the Buyids. <laughs> now things have reached such a state that the court and the divan are full of them, i.e. Shiites, and every Turk has 10 or 20 of these individuals running after him, and their object is to prevent even a few Khorasanis from entering the service of this court and earning a living here. <laughs> In former times, says Nizam al-Mulk, if a man offered himself for service to a Turk as an administrator in any other capacity and said that he was of the Hanafi or Shafi'i sect, Mazhab, uh, and from a Sunni city, he was accepted. But if they said he was a Shiite from Qom, Kashan, or Aveh, he was refused and told, be gone. We kill snakes, not nourish them. <laughs> the Twelver Shiite scholar, Abdul Jalil Qazvini, writing in around 560 or 1165 of the Common Era, in his long, extremely rambling defense of Twelver Shiism, gives a picture partly complementary to that of Nizam al Mulk. Qazvini, the author of this. Uh, it's rambling, it mentions that the judges, he mentions all four of the excellent madrasas in Kashan, not, not all of which I related to you earlier, I skipped some. He also mentions that the judges in Kashan are Shiite, which is extremely interesting. The government apparently uh, realized that only a prominent Shiite could command obedience in the city, so they allowed she I judged to slip under the radar. He refers to the benefactions of Majdadin to the magnificent shrine of Ali ibn Muhammad al-Baqir at Ardahal, which we will see later. The success of Kashani bureaucrats in the late Saljuk administration is well illustrated by the career of Anushirvan ibn Khalid, or Ibn Khalid, founder of the Sharafiya Madrasa. Anushirvan, supposedly a descendant of the Sasanian monarch Anushirvan, which is why he gave himself the name, was one of the clerks who uh, worked for the staunchly Sunni vizier Nizam al-Mulk, despite the vizier's extreme disdain for Shiites. He was especially close to Nizam al-Mulk's son, Mu'ayyid al-Mulk, who was a vizier to the Saljuk Sultan Bark Yaruk, a very important Saljuk Sultan, who ruled from 485 to 498. That's 1192 to 1105 of the Common Era. Under this, the last Saljuk Sultan, Sultan Mahmud, that is of the great Saljuks, not the Saljuks of Anatolia, the last Saljuk Sultan, great Saljuk Sultan, uh, Anushirvan was appointed vizier in 518, but under this greatly enfeebled sultan, Anushirvan could accomplish very little. Quite amazingly, this Shiite clerk was then appointed vizier to the Abbasid Caliph. <laughs> why, why the Abbasid Caliph wanted a vizier from Kashan? Shiite vizier from Kashan, this is puzzling. There were many crypto Shiite viziers to the Abbasid Caliphs before like the Banu Furat under the Caliph al-Muqtadir uh, who ruled in the 
uh, 908 to 932 of uh, the Abbasid of, of the common era. But Anushir Van's Shiism was not secret, as was the Shiism of the Banu Firat. Anushir Van died in Baghdad in 532 uh, or 533 and was buried near the tomb of Ali in Najaf, clear evidence that he was a Shiite. Beside a madrasa and a large library, he had important structures built in Kashan, such as a hospital, Dar Shifa, and a caravanserai. Two families of Kashani scholars of the Saljuk period have the place name Ravandi. Ravand is a small town uh, a few miles from Kashan. One member of the family is Hanafi, uh, the Ravandi I quoted above, the author of Rahat Sudur. The second family, with the, the uh, uh, Nisba Ravandi, were Sayyids and Shi'is, including the very wealthy Majdadin Ravandi, who founded the Madrasiyah Majdiye. He was a nephew of Anushirvan uh, Ebn Khaled, showing that these families cooperated. Another member of the family, the Adin um, Abu Rida Fadlallah was the uh, director of a madrasa and a prolific poet in Arabic. Interesting, at this late period, <laughs> late <laughs> Saljuk period, he's writing in Divan in Arabic. Uh, 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 and as a teacher was, quote, without rival in all the lands of the world for knowledge and religious devotion, end quote. The Ahadin's Arabic divan is filled with references to contemporaries and to Kashan. Uh, he writes of his relative Majdadin, that Majdadin founded schools, madaris, caravanserais, khanat, it, of course it's in Arabic actually, so uh, I should say madaris, <laughs> sorry, khanat, and a hospital, Maristan, is why it's called Dara Shifa earlier, but here it's called Maristan. In another poem, the Aydin also praises his relative for building mosques, water, water channels, and qanatir, which I think is either bridges or aqueducts. I'm more likely to think aqueducts. Perhaps the most dramatic of the Aydin's poems is his description of the siege of Kashan in 532. The poem offers the names of 40 nearby towns and villages attacked. It's a terrific source for local history and is spoiled by the besiegers, but praises Majdadin for paying 40,000 dinars to lift the siege of the city of Kashan itself. Incidentally, shortly after this period, in 595 or 1198 of the Common Era, the Khwarezm Shah laid siege to Kashan, and ha which held out for four months, but was then savagely sacked. Kashan as a center of ceramic production. The Saljuk period saw the rise of Kashan as a major center of ceramic production. Al-Muqaddasi, who was writing much earlier, in thir th 380, of the Hijra, or 990 of the, uh, 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 of the uh, um, common era, twice r mentions Qashan and praises its long-necked bottles, qum qum. Uh, this is presumably, I, I can't figure out if these are brass or, or ceramic. Uh, uh, after reading a lot of dictionaries of <laughs> the word, I, I think it's just an automatic poet, poetic word. When you hold it, it's like kum kum as a drink. <laughs> anyway, a generation later, uh, Zakaria al Qazwini uh, writes, uh, "From Kashan come shiny pottery utensils, alat, wa min al alat al khazafi al madhuna." Shiny is, that's really oily, literally, madhuna, but it must mean shiny. Uh, the, they, that means the Kashanis, have an outstanding gift in this, which other lands do not have. Well, lahum 
في ذلك يد واسطة the utensils alat and vessels the roof or the roof from Kashan are transported from Kashan to other lands إلى سائر البلاد end quote very important quote pottery is both heavy and breakable to be exportable it must be of high artistic quality and strong fabric. The pottery of Kashan from the 12th to the 15th century was both. Its luxury ceramics display two outstanding techniques shown here. On the left, you see Mina'i, or sometimes called half drangs, seven color pottery, because of the seven principal colors used in it. Uh, Mina, uh, you're uh, half uh, rang. Uh, on the right, you see lusterware. Uh, the earliest dated enamel overglaze painting, that's the Mina E technique on the left, uh, um, uh, probably coincides with the invention of this technique in Kashan. Uh, the decorative patterns and illustrative painting is of such high quality in both the luster wear and Minai form that this pottery is widely regarded as related to the emergence of miniature illustrations in books. It may be that in the 12th and 13th century that the term qashi, or in many Arabic dialects ashi, since they turn the qaf into a hamza, Ashi, which means, quote, things belonging to Kashan, passed into other languages, such as, uh, such as uh, Iraqi Arabic and Syrian Arabic, meaning in the meaning of tiles. Ashi, still understood in the meaning of tiles in, uh, in, uh, Ira in uh, Syrian dialect. Some of the ingredients of Kashan pottery were to be found nearby, such as the quartz petals, which are, quote, white, clear, and shiny, not as clear safa as rock crystal, but more clear than white marble. So this is interesting. They, this is a, a quartz, ground up quartz is a part of the fabric of these things. Um, there is a finely divided white stone nearby in the villages uh, next to Fien, and from nearby Qamsar come both a white stone, quote, like white sugar, end quote, so clearly. <laughs> and the famous cobalt glaze called Lajvard. Lajvard, of course, means lapis lazuli, but this was the color of lapis lazuli. Some white clays also come from the Kashan district. Signed works by four generations of Kashan, of a Kashan family of lusterware potters, the Abu Taher family, testify to the many in-house skills and trade secrets that went to the composition of this pottery. I hope all of you saw the wonderful Della Robbia exhibit at uh, Boston Museum of Fine Arts. Was it two years ago, three years ago? More. I, two or three years ago, yeah. Which uh, it shows how inside a pottery family, uh, uh, both techniques and, and sculpture, sculptural uh, uh, can continue. The Della Robbia's, of course, are in 15th century Italy, but <laughs> anyway. At the beginning of the 7th or 13th century of the Common Era, a master ceramicist at the head of another family of Kashani poets, Abu Zaid, collaborated with the head of the Abu Taher family on the tile work in the shrines in Qom and Mashhad obvious places for Shiite people to decorate. <laughs> um, the earliest of these, uh, Abu Zaid, who worked in both Mina'i and Luster, left many signed works, uh, more perhaps than any other potter. The earliest of these signatures is on a Mina'i bowl of 582, that's 1186 of the Common Era, similar to what you see here on the left. Uh, on, the, uh, on other works, he says not only that he made the piece, but that he wrote the inscription, perhaps a reflection of Kashani pride in handwriting. 
We have a treatise on the method of composition of lusterware and Mina'i poetry by a later member of the family, Abu Qasim Abdullah al Kashani. Um, <coughs> wrote a treatise on gems. Of course, this is a, a strong tradition. It starts with Aristotle, who writes a treatise on gems, which is translated into Arabic, incidentally. And uh, it goes on. Al-Biruni writes a treatise on gems. And they, they also consider things besides gems, like, like glazes and so on, in these treatises. Um, and Biruni, as I said, wrote, wrote, wrote one. Um, in this treatise by Abul Qasim, there is a long section about the manufacture of Kashan lusterware and Mina'i pottery. Abul Qasim also wrote a history of an Ilkhanid ruler, and his brother, uh, this is the brother of Abul Qasim, wrote a treatise on Sufism, all of which testify to the high literary achievements of later members of this family. Uh, the family had clearly prospered and benefited from the education available in Kashan to rise to become authors and scholars. In the nearby town of Qohrud, we have the last recorded member of Abu Tahir uh, family who signs, um, uh, he, he signs his pottery tiles. The work of Yusuf, dot, 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 with something missing, Ali ibn Muhammad, dot, 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 the Kashani poetry, Al Ghadairi Al Qashani, spells it with Qaf, working not in luster, the heat, end quote, working not in luster but in blue and white, the technique which would soon dominate uh, in the Timurid period. Thanks to this and similar signatures, we can distinguish four different families of potters and at least seven uh, people outside of these two families. Uh, slide 15. Ah, not very beautiful, but some themes illustrated on Kashani luster wear are specifically Shiite, such as this circular tile with a horseshoe shaped imprint uh, uh, on a foundation plaque bearing the date 711 or 1312 to commemorate a dream visit by Imam Ali. Uh, on his famous uh, mount, which left a hoof print in the dreamer's bedroom. <laughs> it, it also appears that many buyers of Kashani, Mina'i, and lusterware like themes from the Shahnameh, um, such as Bahram Gur, you see on the left, Bahram Gur and Azadeh hunting uh, on the Mina'i bowl shown here on the left. Complementary th themes include the enthroned monarch and musicians, such as seen on the lovely lusterware bowl on the right, which is in the Metropolitan. Most large installations of Kashani luster tiles are at Batulia, the ones that survive, I should say, such as the tomb of Ali in Najaf. Although, interestingly, uh, people who've read all the tiles say that some secular theme tile meant for another place and got, got shoved in to the, <laughs> to the tomb, tomb of Ali, but anyway. Uh, significantly, some of the tiles spent at this point spell Kashan with a cough, not a cough. The cough is an Arabization uh, and uh, as in the star-shaped uh, tile dated 738 or 1338, which says, quote, in the place that this was made, in the place of Kashan, may God the exalted protect it from the accidents of time, end quote. Kashani pottery is reflected in the numerous inscriptions uh, in which the potter says that this uh, inscription is written by the potter in his, in his own ha handwriting. Bichati nafsi. It's interesting. On this Kashani bowl, you see somebody teaching calligraphy <laughs> in the center. He has a board and he's writing things on it and all the students, all the students are copying him 
uh, sitting at uh, crazy cockeyed angles, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and all the students are copying him. Uh, uh, they hold slates or some kind of boards. I, uh, the earliest co dated Kashani lusterware is from 575 or 1179. The latest dated piece is from 739 or 1339. Uh, so we have from the 6th to the 14th century. We have the, the tile that reads, it was written in the place of Qasham on the 10th of Rabia Thani, uh, 738, uh, which is uh, exactly in 1337, in the workshop, Karkhane. This is extremely interesting that it says calls the place of manufacture workshop of the Sayyid of Sayyid, Sayyid of Sadat, uh, Sayyid Ruknadeen Muhammad, son of the late Sayyid Zainadeen Ali, the potter, al ghadari uh, the work of the revered and respected master, Ustad, a, 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 a Jamal the designer, uh, is here. It, 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 there's something missing in, this, in the center. Uh, the mention of the workshop indicates the significant scale of the labor involved, uh, and uh, one need only uh, m uh, understand how difficult it is to build a large kill. And the, in, interestingly, in the book on gems, it describes building the kill for firing the pottery. And uh, the, the, uh, the labor involved in both firing and cooling and decorating and everything, to understand that these, these were uh, uh, large teams who were worked on this, these uh, pottery things. The separate, extremely respectful mention of the designer, Nakash, um, suggests that high, highly, high quality Kashan pottery included the presence of such a person, perhaps a painter, perhaps just a designer for pottery, we don't know, Nakash. Anyway, it's, a, it's an interesting word. Kashan under the Ilkhanids. How much Kashan suffered in the Mongol invasions is a matter of dispute. This is, um, uh, in any case, Kashan thrived in the Ilkhanid period that followed. Perhaps the fate of larger cities like Ray and Esfahan, which were sacked by the Mongols, gave smaller cities like Kashan a temporary advantage. While the trade in lusterware platters continued, Kashan came increasingly to be the most important center of uh, other manufacturers. Already in the era of brown lusterware and blue decorated pottery, Kashan was a major producer of star and cross tiles in these colors for use in architectural ornament. Um, the Pax Mongolica, uh, a controversial term, uh, and uh, anyway, but anyway, Pax Mongolica favored trade. At least we used to believe that. <laughs> uh, which ben and Kashan benefited greatly from its location on several trade routes. Until the 19th century, it was the most important stop between what was Ray and is now modern Tehran, and Esfahan, the great central Iranian city. And it's on many other important routes, which I will skip. Um, the Pax Mongolica also attracted many European merchants, such as Marco Polo. Marco Polo, who stayed at the famous Zoroastrian town near Kashan called Gabrabad, <laughs> which means literally Zoroastrian town, <laughs> says that of the three wise men, uh, that one of the three wise men came from Kashan. His account is somewhat confirmed by a richer narrative from a friar Odorico Podernone, who in approximately 1320, quote, halted at the city of the three magi, which is called Kasan, obviously Kashan, uh, uh, 
a royal city and of great repute, end quote. Another traveler of the late Ilkhanid period was, of course, Ibn Battuta, the Moroccan, who reported that seeing Qashani tiles, as he calls them, on madrasas and Sufi convents, as well as the shrine of Ali in Najaf and in the baths of Esfahan. He compares these tiles to the faience tiles of North Africa called Zalij or Zulej, Azuelos, of course. <laughs> um, in the post-Mongol period, Nasir al-Din al-Kirmani, uh, who flourished around 725, in his history of the period, mentions that Abu Tahir Safiya Din Esmail, who held Kashan as a kind of fief, Suyurhal, showed, quote, kindness to the members of ancient houses, Boyutate Qadim. This is a kind of <laughs> perpetual theme in Iranian thing about ancient houses. Uh, end quote. Very likely, as in neighboring Qom, these ancient houses consisted of both descendants of uh, Iranian landlords and new Arab elites like the Sayyids. Tomb shrines. Just as the landscape had been sacralized by Zoroastrians before the coming of Islam, and the Chahar Tagh fire temple survives nearby Kashan, uh, the presence of Shiism and Sufism resacralized both the town of Kashan and the countryside around it. Um, the prime Sufi example is the tomb of Baba Afzale Kashani, who lived in the second half of the sixth and the first half of the seventh century, uh, six, uh, the Hijra, sorry. Baba Afzal was an outstanding figure in the Sufi philosophical tradition and a gifted poet, some of whose quatrains were later ascribed to Omar Khayyam. His tomb had a handsome conical dome, as you see here, and is nearby. Hosti hostility between Shiism and Sufism, so prominent in pre-Safavid times, was not evident uh, in pre-Safavid times. Tomb shrines of descendants of the Prophet, in called in Persian Imam Zadeh, Z, have always been numerous in Kashan area because of the city's fidelity to Shiism. The most prominent of these tomb shrines is the nearby town of Ardahal, where, as mentioned above, Ali, son of the Shiite Imam Muhammad al-Baqir, is buried. Amazingly, a widely prevalent non-Islamic custom is attached to this shrine. On the second Friday of the Persian month of Mesh, obviously not an Islamic reckoning of dates, <laughs> it's the Persian month of Mesh, the ceremony of carpet washing, Qali <laughs> Shui, takes place at this shrine at what is called a healing spring. It, this, of course, is now all associated with a story of Ali, called Sultan Ali. Uh, he wasn't a sultan, but anyway, son of an imam. The non-Islamic date of the festival suggests that this widely celebrated event is pre-Islamic and associated with the Zoroastrian festival of Tir Gom, in which water is uh, central to the festival. The eruption of Timur, Tamerlane, dramatically changed the dynastic landscape of Iran. Kashan submitted to Timur, without a fight, thank God, in 787 or 1387, and was not harmed. Uh, after Timur's death, his enlightened successors drew on Kashani traditions for the uh, tile work, which was such an important feature of Timurid architecture. The grandson of Timur, Ulugh Beg, reached out to invite the mathematicians and astronomers of Kashan uh, to his, near, his capital, Samarkand. The ex existence of such mathematically gifted and talented Kashanis is at least in part due to the, to the curriculum of the madrasa, which I mentioned above. A highly respected author, 
quote, the most judgely of judges, Akhtar Qudat, whatever that means, Imam din Yahya, Ibn Ahmad, Al-Kashi, Kashi, of course, is short for Kashani, Kashi, uh, wrote several treatises on mathematics, and his descendants continued in this tradition. The benefits of mathematics uh, would be self-evident to many medieval Kashanis who, like their neighbors in, me in central Iran, had problems of surveying, water distribution, uh, design, and the like to figure out. Riyas uh, uh, Jamshid Kashani, who died in, as you there you see in 429 of the Common Era, was the most brilliant mathematician to arise from the late medieval Kashani tradition, perhaps from the late medieval Iranian tradition. Uh, he studied in the Madrasa Khan, founded by the uh, ma uh, mathematician scholar mentioned above. Um, and he is a fifth generation descendant of the poet the Al Adin, whose Arabic diwan we saw above. Um, in this madrasa, the quote, rational sciences, end quote, included mathematics and astronomy, very much central parts of the curriculum. Jamshid was invited to the Timurid capital in Samarkand early in his career. Uh, there, his patron was Timur's grandson, Ulugbeg, one of the most mathematically gifted rulers of the medieval world anywhere. An entire chapter of Jamshid's treatise on calculation, Hisab, is, devote, is devoted to calculating architectural problems, such as those of Mukarna's pattern. I think I first heard about this from Gulru. <laughs> um, in the Turkoman period, after Timurid rule, Kalshan felt under the control of two Turkoman dynasties. Um, Documents and inscriptions from Kashan in the Qaraquyunlu period g give a great insight into the city in the 9th or 15th century. The foundation deed, Vakfname, of Mir Imad Mosque, uh, which is now called Masjid Maidan mostly, in the center of Kashan, is the longest such document. The surviving copy is from 1472, but the original was written much earlier. They, yeah, of course, uh, as in all Vakh, you have to copy it every, every 40 to 60 years <laughs> to keep it. Um, uh, um, OK. In it, Imadadin Shirvani, who died in 872 or 1467, endows the mosque, a Sufi convent, Khanera, and adjoining bathhouses located next to the school Madrasa Khan, with two of the 88 <coughs> portions of the Qanat called Esfid Abad. Why two of the 88 uh, portions instead of one of the 44 portions? I, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, he also endows such property as an oil press, a blacksmith shop, and a bakery. A fair amount of agricultural product 111 jaribs, that's a lot, including farms, mazare, uh, with accompanying water rights in, in nearby Nasrabad and Mohaddabad are mentioned. The salaries of the ulama and the staff uh, in the madrasa are specified right down to the sweeper. Interesting, <laughs> interesting source for salaries in the Middle Ages. Um, the students are to be examined every six months to see if they are worthy of their stipends. <laughs> Take warning. <laughs> another, <laughs> another such deed, dated to 877 or 1473, establishes an endowment for a khanara opposite the mosque on its right side, facing, quote, a building for time and hour. Uh, what is this? The endower uh, 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 gives both the khanara and both the quasi clock tower water rights and properties in the neighborhood of Kashan, 
some on the road to Bid Gol. There is also a mention of a hospital here called Dar Shifa instead of Maristan, uh, as well as salary and equipment for the astronomer, Fakhreddin Ali, who is to work in the clock tower. By the time Josephat Barbaro, the Venetian ambassador to Uzun Hassan, uh, had visited Kashan in 1470, the major exports of Kashan were textiles, which was indeed the business my grandfather and my great-grandfather were wholesale textile merchants, <laughs> uh, uh, as remained a major uh, produce of Kashan right up to the early 20th century. Barbaro writes, quote, we found a well-inhabited city called Qasan, where for the most part they make silks and cottons in so great quantity that he who would spend 10,000 ducats in a day may find enough of that merchandise to spend it on, end quote. Other textiles, such as rugs and felt, were also important, and uh, felt in particular grew in importance as time went on. <coughs> now I have a passage on tax income, which I will skip. I'll just read the uh, last <coughs> quote from it. People there, this is, this is, uh, uh, this is as you see, from Hamdullah Mostofi. Uh, people uh, who was, uh, Mostofi tells you that he's a, he's a treasurer, uh, he's a kind of financial official. People there are 12 or Shiites, uh, and the majority of them are of affable disposition. You know that from knowing me. <laughs> <laughs> and philosophical temperament. There are fewer fools and ignorant people in Kashan. Here, 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 here. The tax, burden, the tax burden of the city and its district, Velayat, is 117 gold dinars. I put an estimate in silver dinars 10 to 1. I'm not sure I stand by that estimate. But anyway, it is far, far above the income in the first mentioned tax income from Kashan of the 4th or 10th century of the, the common era. Uh, another such deed, OK, I will skip. OK, OK, we'll skip the tax. Conclusion. <laughs> Kashan emerged as a small town in part of the shift in wealth occasioned by the Arab conquest. I don't think we ever think about how much the Arab conquest must have resulted in a redistribution of wealth, and in some cases the foundation, in some cases the abandonment of various uh, 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 sites of habitation. This created new cities and enlarged existing cities, as well as causing some cities to be abandoned. Uh, I mean, Shiraz, for example. Shiraz is a place. Uh, 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 the, it, 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 if it existed in the Sasanian period, it was tiny, uh, 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 and it, uh, but yet it becomes by, by the 4th or 10th century of the common era, it's, it's a, emerging as a very major city. Uh, uh, the, these invading Arabs expanded urban life in early Islamic Iran, as well as contracting it. The long period of stability between the Arab conquest and the Seljuk conquest allowed cities to flourish, including Kashan, which is in some sense a new city. From the Seljuk period on, Iran had pastoral rulers who often preferred to use marginal lands for grazing rather than for agriculture. There was strong central control, when there was strong central control, as under the Ilkhanids, and I may be wrong, I, I, People know more about the Ilhanids than I here. Uh, Intercity trade could be extremely important for a city like Kashan with both resources and artisanal skills. Historians of Iran usually consider mountainous areas as refuge areas. Although not mountainous, Kafan also was a refuge area by virtue of its small size and its distance from major cities. Occupation of small, smaller cities would have been hard to sustain, as both food and plunder were comparatively limited. 
thanks to its relative remoteness, Kashan was able to have Shi'i madrasas and Shi'i judges. The Shi'i families that largely controlled the city paid back the population of Kashan by undertaking extensive public work, such as building walls and aqueducts, uh, irrigation systems, and so forth. Depending on the period, Kashan fell under the sway of rulers of Rey, which is modern Tehran, or often rulers of Esfahan, which is nearby. The Shi'i elites of Kashan, therefore, strove for good relations with the Sunni elites in the capital cities. Kashan's comparative prosperity depended on its granat based agriculture, its location on important routes, its continual thriving artisanal traditions, and its emphasis on education. It was fortunate to have leaders and some rulers who invested in charitable trusts that supported valuable institutions such as schools and charities. Education enabled Kashanis to acquire patronage as bureaucrats and astronomers who often in turn patronized their home city of Kashan. Non-educational charitable institutions numerous in Kashan, held together the social fabric of a society with widely disparate levels of income. The continuity of elites, reinforced in Kashan by the presence of Sayyids, fostered stability and almost certainly frustrated some, or stifled many talents. <laughs> but across this, these turbulent centuries of change, Kashan, uh, which was much smaller than Esfahan and somewhat smaller than its uh, Shiite neighbor Qom managed to flourish. Nevertheless, Kashan maintained uh, a, uh, an important regional life and an important artisanal tradition right through to the 9th or 15th century. Thank you.